let's talk a little bit about um, commoditization, the commodity aspect of alternative data, right? There's a lot of argument about, <clears throat> well, alternative data is becoming much more prevalent um, for um, in, in the investment community. Um, so what is, you know, is the alpha being decayed or eroded by everybody having access to the same type of data? So if we take, um, let's, let, let's say, take transaction data, for instance, right? If a fund has access to the category, the broad category of transaction data, um, does that mean that another fund um, may see less value um, when purchasing that same data or that same category of data? Why or why not? Um, is it on the category level? Is it at the vendor level? Where does, where, where does the balance between um, alpha preservation and alternative data and sort of degradation of the commodity value of alternative data sit? Where is that boundary? I can try to give you like a first stab at this question, uh, especially because I'm coming from a different market sector industry background. And that connects also to the previous question. And I have an answer because it doesn't really apply to my industry somehow. Um, and what I'm going to say is going to be controversial, but not everyone has access to the same data, at least in venture. That, that might be true for edge funds, it might be true for other players, but in venture that is not the case. Um, and it's not the case for a bunch of different reasons, but first of all, because I scraping things is very complex from a compliance perspective, is costly to maintain, to do the like in the first place. And historically speaking, the industry hasn't been very data-driven somehow, at least like not like in the same fashion as like the edge fund industry, right? Um, which brings us to the point where a lot of people are buying data from different providers. But these data points are incredibly expensive. So you can buy some of those. You need to buy some of those as a baseline, otherwise you can't do your job. And there are different people that buy different things for different reasons. Um, part of this is related to your investment thesis. If you invest in the UK, you buy a UK data set. If you invest in enterprise, you're gonna buy something else, right? So you don't need to buy every single thing, clearly. You buy only the things that have like, the highest value to your company. And as I was saying before, even if we buy the same data, is as always, what you do with the data sets that matter. So like that, that data points might be the same. And by the way, there is like a small caveat here. The funny thing about our industry is that even if you do your job perfectly, so if you have the best data, the best model, the best team, every single thing on the data side of the list, it still doesn't mean that you're going to be able to win the deal or to close the deal. Because there is always that aspect where someone needs to reach out and convince the founders and trying to see if there is like a fit and everything else, which means that it doesn't matter how good you are like on the data side, clearly that helps, right? Because you can get to a deal much faster than someone else or you know, way before than someone else or whatever it is or had more value. But at the same time, it doesn't guarantee success. It's not like I find a stock which is undervalued, I buy. Yeah, uh, I would argue that, you know, there, again, there's so many data sets and data sources, so it's unlikely that two entities will use the same combination, okay? So, for example, our U.S. inflation forecasting model uses 500 different variables, in, including pollution data from NASA, theater ticket sales in Broadway, a, a lot of things. So it's unlikely that, you know, two investors, we, we rely on the same data set. Even if, you know, uh, two of them use credit card data, uh, there is a lot of variation uh, within that space. Do you, uh, yeah. do you think there's a relationship between the dimensionality of the data set provided and the um, uh, the ability to arbitrage or the, the alpha decay of that data? So it... it does, does, do the dimensions have to do with it? Is the more raw the data, the less likely it's going to be used in the same way? Yeah, no, that's true. It, it's dimensionality referred to complexity, I imagine, of the data set in, in the tap, definitely. But I, I wouldn't speak only about alpha decay. Uh, when it comes to predicting GDP and inflation, this is not going to be arbitrage away. You know, inflation is going to stay. And 
when we speak about trading strategy in, in a space like FX, this is something that we can observe and we observe with some mm, data sets that have been uh, commoditized. But I would argue, you know, it's like having a Bloomberg terminal. Would you extract a lot of alpha? Uh, most probably not because everybody has it. But if you don't have it, you don't have even beta. You don't have alpha, you don't have even beta. So you're left out of the market. So certain data sets, of course, alpha is going to disappear. Most probably new sentiment, but unless you have them, you'll be left out. So you must have them. So this is my argument. No, uh, data sets are going to, to stay here, not because it's alpha disappears, the whole data industry behind this type of data is going to disappear, N not at all. It's going to be commoditized and value will come uh, from the volume rather than alpha. Evan? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important, one, as a consumer of data that every time you approach a data set, you think to yourself, like, what am I trying to get out of this? And sort of Alex alluded to this and Francesco alluded to this as well, which is, you know, sometimes you're just measuring the market. You want beta out of certain things. That's important. That's necessary. Um, sometimes you're looking for alpha. If something is alpha today, you should, you know, I, I think really the lesson to take away from it is you need to keep checking into it periodically and not just trade it blindly and say, ah, oh, the signal was strong six months or a year ago or even yesterday. But make sure that you're still applying, you know, some test against it to say, has this changed? Is it relevant? What is this saying? Um, and also understand who you are in the sense that if you're, you know, trading a strategy that's similar to a lot of other people, that may mean something. You can use something that's oblique when, you know, in prior years I worked at funds that were, you know, more credit focused. And if we were doing things that, you know, everyone was using, but we were applying them to a context that wasn't necessarily the context that everybody else was using them in, that could be a very unusual approach. And so you should always be cognizant of that fact, I think, as a data consumer of just saying, you know, why do I think I have a story to tell here? Um, and just not lose sight of that and make sure that, you know, I think it has less to do with any one individual data set and more about prioritizing them and saying, if you're going to, you know, look at 50 things and say, which one should you start with? You should say, what's the one here that has the most interesting combination of being data and a context that, you know, suggests that I may be able to get some outsized interesting result out of this and then do them in that kind of rank ordering. Because if you're just doing the same thing as everybody else, you're always going to be chasing the tail. So.